Welcome to this service at Faith and Victory Church. This is the place to come to receive your miracle from God. Now, let's join our service already in progress. Go ahead and open your Bibles to the 12th chapter of the book of Hebrews. Father, we thank you for the word of God. We thank you that it is life to our spirit, renewing to our mind, medicine to our flesh. Glory to God. We thank you, Father, as we... Um, Yield ourselves to the Holy Ghost. The utterance will be given by the Spirit. Glory to God. We'll speak under the unction of the Holy Ghost. Glory to God. And it'll pierce the hearts of men and women. Be good seed sown in good ground. And it'll bring forth good fruit in the lives of those who hear. We thank you aforehand for demonstrations and manifestations of the Spirit. Glory. Oh, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for it. We magnify you for this service today. And we honor you in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. Well, looking here in the Hebrews chapter 12, we're going to, uh, let's read verses 1 and 2. Wherefore, seeing we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Now, this, this witnesses are listed in Hebrews chapter 11. You know, we call it the hall of fame of faith. Okay, and not only them, but all those who've gone a four hot time and gone ahead of us and gone into the, and received their reward in heaven. They're, they're, they're in that great grandstand of heaven. Last night we turned on the, uh, we watched the Carolina Clemson game after we got home from the party. And you looked in there and they did aerial shots of the stadium. There was mostly orange in there. I don't know where the Carolina fans ended up. They, they, they went to the wrong stadium or something because it was all, it was about 90% orange, a little, bl a little blue down there. They were in the stands. I think, uh, 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 the Panther Stadium holds about 70,000 people. Well, heaven's got more than that. And they're all up there and they're all cheering us on. Thank, aren't you glad you got somebody cheering you on? Aren't you glad you got somebody saying it's worth it? Hallelujah. Aren't you glad you got somebody saying you can do it? Hallelujah. Amen? So we thank God for that. Hallelujah. But seeing we're compassed about with so great a, great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside. Let us lay aside what? Uh, here. Every weight. Everybody say every weight. And the sin that does so easily beset us. Beset means to knock off stride, to, to not, you know, uh, to get you off pace. If you ever saw the movie Chariots of Fire, ding, 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 you know, and it's the story about Eric Little and uh, Abrams, you know, the Jew in the, in the parallel, the, you know, the Jew running for, for uh, England and, in in, in, I mean, for um, America and uh, uh, Little running for England. He runs for God, you know, runs for England, you know. And um, <clears throat> but in one of the races where Eric Little was running, he, he was Scott, and uh, he was running, and some guy just knocked him into the inner circle. He got knocked off pace, you know. And, um, you know, the Satan wants to knock us off our pace. He wants to knock us off track. Amen. So lay, he says here, lay aside every weight and the sin that does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our Faith. Amen. Hallelujah. Are you glad that we can have Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him uh, uh, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now, we all get this. Sin will inhibit you from doing what God wants you to do. Amen. We all know that. We, we get a lot of preaching about how sin will mess you up. How sin will, will, will uh, uh, tangle you up. How sin will draw you back out of the things of God. How sin will keep and break a connection between you and being able to follow, follow, follow after God. But notice there are two things here. He says, lay aside every weight and the sin. Now, let me say this. Weights aren't sin. Else he would have just said lay aside the sin. The weights are something else. Weights are something that isn't necessarily sin, but it, it entangles you. It trips you up. It knocks you off pace. Amen? It's not that you're just going the wrong way. It's just something that's caused you not to be able to go the way you should, be able to do it the way you should go, do it. Uh, how many know if you're going up a mountain and you're running, you know, you've seen, you, you've seen tractor trails, and you know when they're loaded or not when they're going up the mountain. And when he passes you going up the mountain, he ain't got nothing on that truck, you know? But, you know, you, you, when you're coming up there and you see him going, mm, 
they're over in the right lane and they're just, they're just sitting there. I mean, if, it's like if they took the foot off the gas, they start rolling backwards. They're loaded down. All right? And, you know, and it wouldn't take a whole lot for them to, you know, not be able to get up that mountain at that point. Here we go. So weights, we have, the weights are things that hinder or prevent someone from doing something. They're in hindrance. They're an impediment. Um, uh, it comes from the Greek word angus, angus, angus. Uh, <clears throat> it means what is prominent, protuberant, bulk, bass, hence a burden, weight, an, an encumbrance. So weights, weights here are a hindrance, impediment, or burden that encumbers and oppresses. Something that is, that is, that is there, that's knocking you off stride, something that is there. You know, we, we like to say this, we like to joke about the fact I ride by a golf course on the way to church sometimes. And, uh, you know, they're out there playing golf at 8 o'clock in the morning on a Sunday. You wouldn't be able to get them to the early morning service at a church sometimes. Well, that's, see, golf is a weight. Playing golf's not a sin. On second thought, playing golf's a sin. <laughs> Jeff likes to play golf. Likes to go watch him play golf. Likes to just get out there in his little fancy shorts and his vet and his uh, argyle sweater vest and swing the club. Hallelujah! Yeah, I, I had to stop playing golf for a long time because I was one of those guys who would wrap a club around a tree, you know, or, or throw it four hundred yards, the, the club four hundred yards down the fairway, you know. Uh, so. <laughs> no, let not the sun go down on your wrath. I was over by the end of the day. <laughs> okay, now that we've all scripture ward out, let's go back to the Bible. <laughs> See, playing golf is not a sin. But when it encumbers you and hinders you from being able to do the things you need to do as a believer and run the race that is set before you, it becomes a weight. Okay? You know, it's not a sin to play a video game. But if, you, if you're up to 4 o'clock in the morning playing video games and can't get out of bed to, to go to school or to go to church or to take care of, you know, life, it becomes a weight to you. You're not able to run your race of life the way you should. Amen. Thank you for your two amens, three amens. Now, not only are, are the activities weights, but I, I'm, I'm going to say this, most of our weights, or many of our weights, come from our past. You know, how you were brought up. You know, what kind of family you had. Were you abused? Uh, what things you did in the past. I mean, you did things wrong. You, you know, you robbed a bank, or you shot somebody, or you, I mean, you know, you did things wrong. Or things you didn't get to do that you wanted to do. I didn't have a Gumby and a, and a Pokey when I was a kid, and I'm, I'm, you know, it's just ruined my life. I can't say that because I had two Gumbies and two Pokies, I know, because I broke the wires in them. <laughs> now, when you bend them enough, they, wait, they break the wires. I said they had little wires in that rubber thing. You could bend enough, it'd break it. Um, loss of loved ones. You know, experiences of the past can hold you back. You could think because, you know, um, you grow up poor, you, you don't belong, you, don't, you, know, you never think you're, you measure up. You never think you, you're good enough. You know, you grew up poor. You grew up on the wrong side of the family. You grew up in the wrong race. You grew up in, in you were multi-ethnic, you know, and so, you know, you don't fit in any community. You know what? You know what I'm saying? You go to the African-American community and you're white. You go to the white community and you're, you're black. I mean, you know, you just think, things like that. All those things can become weights in your life. You know, we were poor. Now, Janie, Janie at one time, I, you know, well, I, she never lived in a really nice, nice house when they were growing up. Uh, they, I remember she talked about one house that was so, it was so bad you could see through the cracks in the floor and see under the house. You know, the, 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 uh, the, the wood, you know, the, the, whatever it had, they had kind of filled the wood with it. Fall, well, you could just look right there and see under the house. And when, I, when we were dating the house that she lived in, they only had heat in one room. That was the center room. They had a little, one of those old oil heaters. You know what I'm talking about? It just sat in the middle of the room. You know, and her mama, had to, her mama had to learn how to fix the oil heater because oil heaters are notori notorious for clogging up. And you had to go in there and you had to open it up and get the valve cleaned out and then get it all back together and get the heat running because if you didn't, you didn't have any heat. Her bedroom was on the back, was on an addition, kind of an old addition. It was an old house, so it was an old addition to the house. But back there, her and Susie slept. They, had, they, they bought electric blankets for themselves. They went out and earned money to buy electric blankets for themselves because there was no heat back there. They had about six of those old country blankets. You know what I'm talking about? The kind of, that are, that are, that are square patterns also, and they're heavy as all get out. And they put the electric blanket on the bottom, put all them on top, and turn them on about 30 minutes before they went to bed. Then they run in the bed and jump in there and pull the covers up and climb up and pull up at the head. It was so cold in there, you could see the smoke on their breath. 
That's how cold it would get in the winter. And then in the summer, it was so hot, you could, I mean, you couldn't breathe. Then somebody broke into the house one summer. They couldn't, they had, they, her daddy nailed the window shut. What about that much space at the bottom? You know, so it just made it worse. I mean, she was laying in bed, and the guy came right between her and Susie's bed, came in the window. Went in the house, ate food, went in purses, the robbed stuff. Yep. Came right between her and Susie's bed. Yep. Now, that's when we were dating. I was, she was about 17, 18 years old when that happened, you know. Um, so, you know, she grew up poor. So you can grow up poor and, and, and let that affect you. Well, I, you know, I'm on the wrong side of the tracks. I don't belong, you know. You got that, that, the, the, uh, the Tams did that old song. I think other groups did it. But the, I remember the Atlanta Tams did it. Down in the boondocks. You know, people let me down, you know, because I'm on the wrong side of town. Down in the boondocks. See, <clears throat> your past experiences can become weights to your life. You can let it hinder you from going forward and doing what God has for you to do because it's weighing you down that I don't belong or I don't deserve or it ain't right for me to have. Those are weights. And so we want to be what? Paul says here, I believe Paul wrote Hebrews, but, you know, you can argue with me. It doesn't matter. We'll find out when we get to heaven. All right? But the writer, listen, the writer says here, um, he says, let us lay aside every weight. So whether it's a weight of activity, whether it's a weight from the past, whether it's a weight of, of not belonging, whether it's a weight of thinking you, oh, you're entitled to everything, whether because you got born, born with a silver spoon in your mouth, you're rich, and you just think everybody belongs, everybody's supposed to bow down to you because you, you, know, you, you, you drive a Lamborghini. I saw some guy the other day in the Maserati. I came up behind a Maserati. I thought, hmm. You know what, I had to get out. I got out and got a jar because of honey just dripping off out there on the road. You know, I had a big jar of honey when he, he pulled off. I mean, that thing was sweet. Praise the Lord. So, um, the weights sometimes come from our past. Now, as a believer, we must be aware that when we're born again, it's our spirit that gets saved, not your soul. See, when you got born again, you're, you're the new man, the, in, the internal man, the, the spirit of man. First Thessalonians 5.23, we've quoted it a thousand times. Uh, I pray God the, uh, that he sanctify you wholly. W-H-O-L-L-Y. Uh, and preserve your whole spirit, soul, and body. Blame us unto the coming of the Lord. What? Spirit. So, uh, you got your pneuma, your suke, and your soma. Okay? Your, your pneuma, your suke, and your soma. The spirit, the soul, and the body. When you got born again, you didn't get a new body. Wouldn't that be great? Come on down to Faith and Victory Church. You're talking about CrossFit. You'll leave here. You'll, be, you'll, be, you'll have a six-pack. You'll be ripped. I mean, because you got saved. You got a, you're a new man. See, I, I wish it worked that way. Don't we all wish it worked that way? It doesn't work that way. How are you going to get your body like that? Exercise. Your spirit gets born again. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Your spirit man gets born again. But you know what? The Bible says, but be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Receive with meekness, James says. The engrafted word which is able to save your souls, your suke. Not your, not your pneuma. Your suke. Your soul gets renewed or saved or restored through the renewal process. So when you got born again, you didn't get your head fixed. And so you've got to, you've got to do what? You've got to put away weights. You've got to put away things in your soul that hold you back. Well, I don't belong here. Janie, Jan, it took Janie. I mean, I'd go to restaurants and didn't feel like I belonged in there. Your, your money, she would say, your money's just as good as theirs? I mean, I didn't feel like I, I mean, I'm, supposed, I'm supposed to be eating out there in some old, you know, hole in the wall, uh, you know, joint, you know, where, where you know, you, you well, there was one in Greenville one time, uh, it was a place called uh, Venner's Grill. Now, it got flooded with the hurricane that came in like the, a while ago, 99, 98, whenever that hurricane came in down at Cape Fear and blocked the rivers up and flooded all East Carolina. I, I forgot the name of that one, Hugo, something, whatever it was. Well, down in Greenville, they, they, everything on the, uh, the uh, west side, north, north side of the Tar River flooded. I mean, houses were underwater just because that land was lower on that side of the, of the Tar River in Greenville. And it, because the dam up on the Tar River, Rocky Mountain, broke, it flooded Princeton. Uh, the first African-American community, either North Carolina or the United States, I'm not sure, uh, chartered by African-Americans right down there below Tarboro was completely wiped away. The whole town was wiped out. Well, down there, you know, uh, Greenwood, he got flooded out. And, but there was a grill over there called Venner's Grill. Now, you used to go to that. Now, let me tell you something. You hear these places talking about country cooking? They had sweet potato biscuits. Wow. If you ain't never had a sweet potato biscuit, you ain't had a biscuit. 
They were biscuits made like but they had sweet potatoes mixed into the mix. And mm. Law. And they, they had pots with collards and cabbage and all kinds of stuff. And, and, and then meats. And you got, you got refills with all the, all, the, all the vegetables. So you can go in there and get a meat and vegetables. You go, so you go get you a piece of some fried chicken and collards. And that. they give you all the collards and mashed potatoes you wanted while you had sweet potato biscuits. Now, let me tell you what this place was like. The, the entrance to the place was framed in, but dirt. The floor was dirt. You opened up the opening to go in, and, and it was a kind of a buffer on the air going into the place. It was dirt. And when you went in there, there was picnic tables. That you, and you just sat, it was a community picnic table. If there was a place you sat there, it didn't matter. If you knew, knew the people, didn't know the people, didn't want to know the people, it didn't matter. That if, you, if you went to see, that's where you sat. And when you, they didn't ask, can I sit here? They just sat there. Now, that's the kind of place I thought I was supposed to be. Now, it was good food. I got that. But you, know, you take me someplace like Ruth's Chris, and I was all uptight. I didn't belong there. You know? I didn't grow up rich like that. I didn't grow up that. I didn't grow up in those kind of places. You know? Uh, I mean, I, all my clothes used to come from Kings. Y'all remember Kings? You know? Kings clothes. It was old, it was old department store. I mean, it was, it was the Walmart of its day. King's Department Store. You know, and then, then I graduated to the International Clothier of Jean-Claude Panet. Jean-Claude. Where'd you get your clothes? Jean-Claude. <laughs> Sounded better, but it was J.C. Penney's. You know, uh, I, didn't, I, I didn't wear... Cat just got it. <laughs> He said, there and goes, oh, now I get it. <laughs> Jean-Claude Penet, J.C. Penney's. <laughs> Just up there going, what's he laughing at? I still don't get it. <clears throat> I wasn't wearing designer clothes. I wasn't wearing, you know, I didn't even buy Levi jeans. You know, I, I bought, I bought J.C. Penney's plain pockets, you know, because I, could, I, couldn't, I couldn't afford it. And, and didn't have the money, and, and then and, you know, and then then you walk into some place where they're they're wearing hand tailored suits, and they're wearing hand, you know, their shoes are made by a cobbler, and you're supposed to go in there. I didn't feel like I belonged in there. You understand what I'm saying? And we can all have those kind of things. Now I, I, I'll go to Ruth Chris in a heartbeat. Now, and I'll tell you something. I'll go in there in my jeans, because my mon my my money spends just as good in jeans as it does in hand tailored suits. Uh, I took Janie not too long ago. I, I, took, her, I took her over. We had, we had a little extra money. And I said, well, let's, let's go do something special because she hadn't done anything special in a long, long time. So I took her to Ruth's Chris. We, we didn't, like, go spoil. We, we share. You know, of course, you share there. But we share. Didn't go overboard. Didn't get dessert. Didn't do anything extra. Just And uh, we called and um, I said, we, one of the waiters that used to work at Kabuto's, I mean, the manager just works there now as a waiter. I said, well, is, is uh, Rob still working with you guys? So they said, yeah. I said, can I have Rob as my waiter? Oh, sure. Now, let me tell you something. I mean, we're just sitting there in jeans. they got people walking in. These, the, I mean, stilettos this tall. I mean, they're decked out, hair. I mean, earrings. I mean, they're all out, you know. So, it didn't bother me. It doesn't bother me. I'll go in there. I'll do, praise the Lord. Now, Rob had, out, he, he was working on the other side. So, he was, he was a head waiter for us. But he had all the guys. To get, he said, now, look, you take care of the tailors. And, buddy, we got service. We didn't, I mean, you couldn't, I mean, there was, and I'm like, which, who are you? That's Aubrey. Then there's Emmanuel. Then there's, you know, somebody. I had so many people coming by the table checking on us, it wasn't even funny. <laughs> now, I don't care because I got a revelation that it's okay. That, that, that's not a weight. I would, she would, she want to go someplace. Like, I'm, I don't belong in there. And that was a weight. See, my past was a weight to me going forward. Now, that's a natural thing. See, these same things can happen spiritually. Okay. We, we don't belong. We're not, we're not right. You know, uh, the, all kinds of things can come on us from our past, and we cannot let them. We've got to throw them off so we can run our race and do what God has for us to do. Can you say amen? Amen. amen. And so we understand because we're, 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 uh, we're a new creature and in Christ Jesus. We've got to realize that the past has to be dealt with through the renewing of the mind. Uh, you know, you know and the, these things will weigh us down. They'll inhibit, it'll inhibit your spiritual growth. Weights will inhibit your spiritual growth. I'll say it again. Weights will inhibit your spiritual growth. 
Well, I don't belong, you know, or, or I'm not worthy, or I don't measure up, or God, or, or here, and it kind of translates to this. Well, I know God will do it for Pastor Ed because he's the preacher and he's special, but he won't do it for me. See, that's that same thing about go, me going into a fancy restaurant. You're just applying it in spiritual matters with you and God. It's the same thing. See, God loves us equally. God is not a respecter of persons. The only thing God respects is faith. But he's not a respecter of persons. Amen. Hello? What are you saying, Pastor? I'm saying if you're living in the projects in the fourth, as a fourth generation project person, or if you're living in your own 17,000 square foot home that lights travel through the house as you walk on and off. I went in one of those one time. Somebody was in the church, was, uh, was doing sound, well, they're still doing them. It's Alan. Alan was doing sound system. And um, he, he, we, we were going to meet for lunch or something. He said, well, come on, why don't you meet me over, this, over here and uh, I, got, I got to do some work on this house and, and, I, and I'll, I'll take it through. They were building the house still. And he was putting in the sound. I mean, they had a mechanical closet for the sound system. environmentally controlled mechanical closet for the sound system and the AV system. And so you had DVD players, you had VHS players, you had sound systems, and every room had a touch pad that controlled what you got to see from there in that room. So you could have a, DV, a VHS or you could have a DVD in there and go in any room in the house and watch the, that. You could be watching it in, in different parts of the house. Then they had a lighting system. That when you came in the door, as you walked, lights would turn on. As you got past it, they'd turn off. The house was, the house was 12,000 square feet and a $2 million house. The, the audio visual system was somewhere in the neighborhood of 100, 150 grand. Hello. Now, you can live in the projects, or you can live in that, and God doesn't respect your person either way. When you come before the throne of God, you come clothed in the righteousness of God that's in Christ Jesus. It doesn't matter if you came out of that 12,000 square foot house, or out of that you know, government subsidized apartment. It doesn't matter when you come to God how, what, where you're living. In fact, is you're coming as a, as a new creation in Christ Jesus, and he'll honor your faith. I don't care where you came from. <laughs> and so you can't go because I'm living over in the projects. God's not going to hear me, but he's going to do something for the Mr. 12,000 square foot house guy. Hello? He's not going to bless him more than he blesses you. Well, he gives more money to the church. And let, if he's tithing, he's not giving that penny more than you. If you're tithing and he's tithing, you're giving the same amount. What do you mean? You're giving percentage, not dollar amount. God, the tithe is percentage. And so God's not going to bless him more just because he tithed than he's going to bless you because you tithe. And so we, gotta let that, we can't let that stuff hold us back. We've got to be bold. We've got to go forward. We can't let where we are or where we're not inhibit us from going on and doing what God has for us to do. Can you say amen? We've got to throw those things away. So we've got to renew our mind. Romans 12, 1 and 2, beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service or spiritual service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. We know what this means. We've preached this sermon hundreds of times. As a matter of fact, we just preached on decisions. The, the word transform, it comes from metamorpho, it means metamorphosis. And conform means to be fashioned or shaped or molded. Boy, I bet I'm giving the camera guy a fit back there. How, brother Bill, how you doing? I'm just running circles around the podium. Hallelujah. Ah, oh, praise God. The other day I was running, for, uh, Bill wasn't here, I was running it, and I, I came and got there, I said, you got to go run it. I forgot who was preaching, I think Benny was preaching. Benny walks as bad as I do. You know, and I'm looking back and forth, and I started, I almost started getting like vertigo, and go, because I had my glasses on, and I was, I, 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 okay, okay, so I just got to do this, bless you, brother Bill. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise God. Let us lay aside every way and the sin that does so easily beset us. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Romans. We're back over. I'm still, I'm still reading Hebrews. You know, um, be, be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. What, what does uh, James say? It says, receive and meekness, the engrafted word of God, which is able to save your soul. 
Hallelujah. We have to change the way we think about ourselves. We have, why? Because we cannot let those things be weights in our life. We have to cast them off. We have to rise up. We have to be the champions that God called us to be. We have to be believers like God called us to be. We got to be able to look and take the word of God and go out there and say, I'm not going to be held back. I'm not going to be stopped. I'm not going to let this thing from the past keep me down. I'm rising up because I'm a new creature in Christ. And I'm telling you, I belong in the kingdom and God's my source. Hallelujah. And I'm going to run out here and run my race and win, praise God. And I'm going to lay aside those weights. What do we renew our minds to? Number one, how God views your past. Many people view their past contrawise to the way God views it. I heard, I heard, uh, uh, Copeland or somebody like that one time say this. He, you know, the devil came in and said, well, you, you're, you, you're a fancy thing. You up here wanting to do this and do that and saying all these great things about who you are. And don't you know that on such and such date you did such and such? He said, no, I didn't. Oh, yes, you did. No, I didn't. Now you're taking up lying. No, I haven't. Why? Because the man that did those things no longer exists, praise God. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away and all things are become new. That man died and a new man took his place. So the man that did those things no longer exists. We have to come and begin to see ourselves and see our past the way God sees our past. Now I'm going to tell you something. That was better preaching right then than you were shouting. I'm not going to preach it again just to get you to shout. <laughs> Next time, jump in there. Come on, notes. Hallelujah. How does God view our past? Isaiah 43, 25. I, even I, am he that blotteth out thy transgressions for mine own sake and will not remember thy sins. Why does God, see, why does God blot them out for his own sake? Because the one who has the right to judge you for your past blots them out. Therefore, he has nothing to judge. So when the accuser of the brethren come and stand before God and says, Penny did such and such, God says, no, she didn't. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And the accuser goes, here it is right here. And God says, take another look at it. It's blotted. I blotted it out. Hallelujah. And I will remember them no more. That way when the accuser comes and you go to God, Say, oh, seven years ago, I, 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 I stole a, a, a BB bat, you know, the candy, from the candy store. Oh, God. God said, what are you talking about? Well, you know what I did? And I, I, I blotted it out. And I'll remember it no more. See, we have to begin to take a view of our past the way God takes a view of our past. Amen. Jeremiah 50, 20 says, In those days and in that time, saith the Lord, the iniquity, I love this verse. Listen to this. The iniquity of Israel shall be sought for. By who? The accuser of the brethren. Who else? And there shall be none. And the sins of Judah, and they shall not be found. For I will pardon them whom I reserve. Did you hear what God said? They're going to they're come looking for them. And they won't be found. They'll try to look for the sins. And what did it say? It said, stop it, stop it. And they should not be found. There'll be no, there'll be no, there'll be none. The iniquities won't be there. And the sins won't be found. Because God will pardon. So you've got to stop letting the devil beat your brains in with what you didn't do right and how you messed up here and what you didn't do right there. Now, folks, this is where grace is true. This is Bible grace. Amen? When you've put it under the blood, God says, I won't. You are, you are under grace. It is under his grace. His grace provided the mercies. His grace provided Jesus to save you. His grace provided the blood to wash you. 
Well, you can, I mean, that's where you stand in the grace of God, the strength of God, and, and, the, and, the, and, and, and just go, whoa, praise God, devil. Don't even, don't even talk to me about that mess. Because God says it can't be found. Hallelujah. And they don't, don't even exist. Are you here? Look at, look at Micah 7, 19. He will turn again and he will have compassion upon us. He will subdue our iniquities and cast all our sins, what? Into the depths of the sea. Now, have you ever noticed whenever you drop something out in the ocean, uh, it's gone? Now, we went out uh, a, few, a couple, three years ago. I guess somebody graduated. We went on a cruise. Nathan's high school graduate, so that'd be 2012. Wow, man, hadn't been on one since. Oh, Jesus. Anyway, I tell you, I like the cruises because all that food, I mean, all that food, Lord have mercy. I mean, you go to the island and all that food. Yeah. They have, they have a thing called the Coco Loco. It's a, it's a, it's a non-alcoholic drink. And it's, it's, anyway, excuse me. I'm sorry I got off there. Hallelujah. Move out there and, and, and you're out there and, and there's a mile of ocean water under you. And your sins just got dropped off the back of the boat. They're in the depths of the sea. Are you here? I said, are you here? He'll subdue our iniquities and cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. Why? To be, to be lost forever. Amen. So how does God view your past? Everything that's a weight and everything that's a sin, God's already dealt with in his dealings with you as not existing. You grew up on the wrong side of the track. That doesn't matter. You grew up with a silver spoon in your mouth. You've had everything you want, so you think you're entitled to everything on the planet. It doesn't matter. As you renew your mind to how God views your past, and how God sees your past, and the things that have become weights in your life, God says you, you, get, a, you, get, a, you get a new start, you get a, fresh, you get a fresh brand new start. You ever been coloring or doing something on a piece of paper and got frustrated and just balled it up and started over? Because you couldn't fix enough of what was there to make it right? That's how God did you. Next, how did God view my past? How does God view you now? As important as he views your past, how does he view you now? Well, number one, um, 1 Corinthians 1, 2, to the church of God, which is in Christ, at Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus. Now, the King James says this, called to be saints. The words to be are italicized, meaning they're not in the Greek, and so let's take them out because they're not there. There's not a Greek equivalent to those words. They're not there. Added by the translators because they think it helps make it read better. Okay? Anytime you in your Bible has italicized words, that's what it means. It means it's not there. They thought it would help it run, read smoother, but that's why they italicized it so you would know it wasn't there. All right? So sanctifying Christ Jesus called saints. See, that changes the whole thing. Not called to be saints, called saints. It's a whole different meaning. If I'm called to be something, it means I'm trying to achieve it. Here he says, you're called saints. Why? Because that's how God views you now. God's view of you now is a separated holy one. Praise God. So we've got to start seeing ourselves the way God is. With all who are in every place call on the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. 1 John 3, 3, 1. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. What God's love bestowed upon us and calls us the sons of God. We're called saints, we're called the sons of God. God's view of you now is completely different than the past view you had of yourself. God does not view you as someone from the wrong side of the tracks. God does not view you as a failure. God does not view you as someone who can't ever make it. God does not view you as someone who's over and over and over and over again tried and tried and tried and tried and always come up short. God views you as a saint. God views you as his son, glory to God. God views you victorious. God views you the overcomer. God views you the head and not the tail above only and not beneath, glory to God. God's view of you is different and it does not contain the weights that are trying to hold you back. They are from the enemy. They are from the devil. They are from the fallen nature. They are things that are trying to keep you out of what God has blessed and planned for your life. Can you say amen? amen. Hallelujah. What, what and not, only do, not only how he views us now, but who we are in Christ. So we're going to wrap up in this, this particular thing. He views us in Christ what? Number one is new creatures. 
Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. All things have become new, and all things are of God. You've got to understand, yes, your spirit was born again. You've got to renew your mind. But you've got to renew your mind to understand God's made you a new creature. Say, I'm a new creature. One translation says, an old, a new species of being that never existed before. Woo, glory. I'm brand new. That's why you can say, the man that did those things doesn't exist anymore. Randy Greer, um, you know, he, he was, he was an escaped convict. He was um, uh, on the Strike 3 program, meaning a, a, uh, well, not, a, a, not a hardened criminal, but a um, uh, habitual criminal. And so uh, he, when he went back to jail, he was going to be life without parole. There's no need to have him in society. He's going, he's going to continue living as a convict. And so he got saved, and then the Lord said, go turn yourself in. What? They don't know where I am. If I go back to jail, it's for life. Go, go turn yourself in. So he went and turned himself in. And, of course, you know, he, once he got turned in and you know, all the stuff was taken care of, he was, he was put in jail, and his paperwork said this, you know, uh, uh, incarcerated or, or you know, penalty, life. Uh, reviewable for parole in the year, None. Life without parole. Got a hold of Brother Hagin's books and started reading his books. Got to speak in the word. See, I tell you, when you see, when you see who you are in Christ, you can change things. You can change you. And you know, he could have said, well, you know, uh, daddy was a drunk and, you know, and I lived this way. And I just, you know, I'm never going to measure up. So therefore, you know, just to be real honest with you, what's going to happen here is I'm going to spend the rest of my life in prison. Oh, I'll get to go to heaven. Yeah, I will. But, you know, I'm just an old, I'm an old sinner saved by grace. I'm just, you know, uh, if I hadn't been born when I was born, you know, those, those are weights. But he began to say, I'm a new creature in Christ Jesus. Old man passed away. All things become new. And then he would go to the guard, and he put his arm, you know, he couldn't really put his arm around him, but he'd go to the guard. And, he, and that guard knew, you're a life without parole. He said, you see those gates? He said, one of these days, he said, I'm going to walk right through them gates of free man. And the guard would laugh at him. I said, the guard would laugh at him. Because he knew. He knew he was life without parole. That's not life. With the option for parole and you know, 25, they'll review your case. Life without parole. And he kept getting a hold of the word of God. And he kept speaking. And he kept, got his faith out there. And he began to see who he was in Christ. He began to see himself as a different man. You know, he was a preacher in prison. He was getting people saved and preaching and getting them filled with the Holy Ghost. And then, and then one day, his paperwork came down. And he had been, he had been uh, pardoned. Letters had got written to the governor and stuff. They, he got pardoned. And so that same guard walked into the gate and unlocked the gate and crying said, you, you're free. Because he saw him live it. He saw him transform. He saw him change. He saw a man drop the weights off of his life. See, he's God had already forgiven the sin. But that weight of you don't measure up and you don't deserve and you can't ever have, he got out of his life and he became a, became, became a man of faith and walked out that door a free man. And went to Raymond Bible Training Center. Got around Brother Hagin. And, and Brother Hagin kind of took him under his wings. Began to minister and train him up and bless him. And he, he began to grow in the things of God. And then he, he, they graduated. And they launched him out into full-time ministry. And he was driving all over the place. And, you know, he was, he was um, you know, he, had, he could take a commercial airlines. He was fly, you know, he could fly uh, as a passenger. And uh, it just got so big in his ministry, he needed a plane. But you see, felons can't have planes. You can't have your pilot's license. You can't have your pilot's license. And so he started believing God that he'd be able to get his pilot's license. He didn't know how that was going to operate. Well, Brother Hagin and some others began, uh, wrote letters to the governor of Texas. And it wasn't, you know, too, too off long. It took a period of time. His record got expunged. Not pardoned. See, pardon got him out. A sponge wiped the slate clean. The slate clean. Boy, I got that messed up, didn't I? Got the slate clean. And he went and got his pilot's license. And he flies all over the place. Why? Because he didn't let the weights of his past knock him off his race. 
So he wasn't, he wasn't dealing with sin. It wasn't like he was going down, you know, having to, you know, well, he's going down to the bar and picking up a, a girl and going home and sleeping with her every night. He wasn't having, that wasn't what he was dealing with. He, he, he was dealing with the weights of his past. He didn't deserve, he didn't, it wasn't right. He shouldn't have it. He was a criminal. He had past, all this, but he got all that off of him. And now he flies, he's got his own plane, flies all over the country, all the time. Preaching the gospel. Why? Because he got rid of the weights that beset you. Not only beset you, easily beset you. And he began to run his race. Look into Jesus. Didn't know how they were going to get him a license. God did. God knew what to do. God moved on the heart of the king, the governor. And now, he's, now he can get in an airplane and fly anywhere he wants to fly. Seen his airplane. Well, actually, the one he had before, he, he's got a new one now. Yeah. Went and picked him up, flew, out, flew into Greensboro, went and picked him up, went out and looked at his airplane. He flies all over the place. He ain't supposed to be flying. The world says you can't fly. God says you can fly. The world says your past is holding you back. God says your future is your destiny. God says you can take your past because I've already dropped it into the sea. And not just your sins, now you can take all those weights. All those things that say you don't measure up, you don't deserve, you shouldn't have, you can't because. Well, it's just it's like putting on flap jackets one after the other and then trying to go out and run a sprint. You ain't going to make it. But as you lay on the side, it gets easier to run. You get down to that last one. When you pull that off, baby, you can take off and go. Wide open. Amen. Are you here? I remember when I played in high school, we played football. Uh, you hated the day that, you know, coach, you know, they wouldn't make you run a mile every day. And you always wanted it to be on Thursday because you, you, you were dressed out light. You didn't have on, you just had your shoulder pads and hem on. You didn't have on the, the, the pants with the, the hip guards and the back, the, 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 the bow, uh, tailbone guard and the knee pads and all that, just extra weight. I actually liked it when you didn't have any of that stuff on. You just had your helmets and you just kind of walk through plays. I'm saying it was a whole lot easier to run that mile with all that, none of that equipment on. But you let up all that equipment, got to run that mile, and boy, it just like it doubles it up. <laughs> you know? I'm telling you, I mean, it, get, it just get heavier and heavier every step you take. Praise God. But God says it's time to take the helmet off, take the shoulder pads off, take the knee pads off, take the hip guards off, take the tailbone guard off. Glory to God. I mean, get the neck roll off. Hallelujah. Get the arm pads off. Hallelujah. And run. Get rid of your weights. See yourself the way God sees you. Can you say amen? Amen. amen. Uh, we're new creatures. We're heirs of God. We're, uh, uh, Galatians 4, 7 says that we're no longer servants. We're sons. Romans 6, 8, 16, 17 says we're heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. And then it says this in, in Romans 8, 37. And all these things were more than conquerors. When we take a new view of who we are. We can strip off the weights and we can run the race and we can win the battles and we can do what God called us to do and we can enter into the fullness of his plan for our life and we can do it without being hindered and held back. We don't have to stay knocked down. We don't have to stay dragging. You know, how many of you ever run with, with ankle guards on? Hate them. Because, I mean, after about five steps, they get heavy. You know? I mean, you, you, can't even, you start dragging your feet because they, they're just so heavy. God says, lay, lay aside the weights. We trust that you were blessed by the Word of God and the flow of the Spirit of God in this service. If you would like to contact us, please write us via email at office at fbc.org or using our mailing address, P.O. Box 7752, Greensboro, North Carolina, 27417. If you would like to contribute to our ministry, please go to our website at www.fbc.org and click on the Giving Online button. Thank you, and may God richly bless you for your giving.